case, maybe we can start and we join in the meantime, we'll join um, later. So I will present myself. So I'm Marcus Stolani. I'm from Greenwich Europe based in Brussels, which is uh, an expert group of experts um, working on green innovation. We are actually working on the Startups Project, uh, leading replication activities with a group of uh, Flower Cities. And today, together with the Lighthouse and the Flower Cities of our project, we are, have decided to organize this event and talk about our ambition and the mission that we have to follow climate neutrality objectives and become climate neutral cities before 2030. So just a few words about the project because some of you might not know it. Um, so Stardust is a project funded by the Horizon 2020. Uh, it's a smart cities project and it brings together advanced European cities, thus forming them into a constellation of innovation islands, exemplary models of smart, highly efficient, intelligent and citizen oriented cities. So as you can see, it's a holistic um, smart city project covering the whole specter of uh, smart city aspects. Uh, we have three lighthouse cities today. We'll hear from two of them and uh, three follower cities. We used to have four. Unfortunately, one of the cities decided to leave the project. So now we only have three. We have 29 partners in total uh, from nine different European countries, including industrial partners, uh, SMEs, uh, some, little, uh, some leading technical partners. So there's um, quite a huge diversity in the partnership between startups which makes it also a very interesting and very overall project. We have uh, 21 million euro in budget, uh, out of which 18 come uh, from the Horizon 2020 program. So you fund it. Um, the project started uh, five years ago. Unfortunately, we had to face uh, some, some issues and challenges due to the pandemic. So um, even though it was supposed to finish in September 2022, it was extended and will finish in March 2024. Um, as I said, we have three uh, lighthouse cities, Pamplona in Spain, Tampere in Finland, and Trento in Italy. Uh, today, we'll hear, we'll hear from Tampere and Pamplona. Trent unfortunately, could not participate today. And um, now for the follower cities. So the follower cities are following uh, what the lighthouse cities are doing and are finding effective ways to replicate uh, the solutions and the approaches uh, in the lighthouse cities. So um, we have three lighthouse cities and two of them will present today. So we have Cluj, uh, Derry, Kozani, and Litonic, unfortunately left the project, so they are not part of it anymore. Today, we'll hear um, from Cluj, Napoca, and Kozani. Um, you can just see uh, the geographic uh, coverage of Stardust. You can see that we are quite well uh, spread over Europe. Uh, we have some partners or some cities in the South also in the Eastern Europe, as well as in Western Europe. And we had uh, little it's in Central Europe. Unfortunately, this is not the case anymore, but you can see that uh, the spread of the cities was uh, very balanced across uh, Europe. Um, the main project objective, so uh, it's a holistic project, which intends actually to create low carbon, high efficient and intelligent and citizen oriented cities through um, different solutions, buildings, uh, mobility, uh, efficient energy, ICT, as well as uh, innovative business models, engaging with different kinds of stakeholders and involving uh, citizens in the whole uh, process through different co-creation approaches. But also Stardust intends to create uh, so-called innovation islands uh, as urban incubators where uh, different scalable, cost-effective and bankable urban scale solutions can improve energy efficiency and become inspiration to others. Now, uh, we intend also to create smart ecosystems, uh, implementing a new economic paradigm in the European cities based on eco-innovation, competitiveness, low carbon circular economy, and the creation of new markets through involving uh, all the stakeholders in the process. And we are also and have been developing uh, open city platforms on uh, exploiting uh, the nature of ICT and uh, using data, which is very important nowadays. And of course, uh, the last point is to um, ensure transfer of this, um, of this knowledge and of these solutions from the lighthouse cities to flower cities and make sure that actually uh, the flower cities can follow suit and uh, also become smart and uh, climate neutral. Um, so for today, this is the agenda. So, uh, 
to have uh, a welcome speech from uh, our managing director, Virginia Mosterin Perdiguero, and from uh, Ms. Nula Tompolidou, the vice mayor of uh, the city of Kozani. Then we'll have a presentation of the city of Kozani, flowing by Cluj, Pamplona, and Tampere. Then uh, around the discussion about uh, about uh, the plans for the cities, the technologies, the financing, and other aspects uh, will be organized. Hmm. Moderated by Yanis Falas from uh, the cluster of bioeconomy Western, uh, Western Macedonia and me. And then at the end, we'll have conclusions to wrap up. And the foreseen end is half past one. So um, just a few technicalities. We are recording the webinar. It will be made available uh, to uh, to the participants as well as the presentations and uh, all the attendees are in listen only mode but you can ask questions using the q a feature which you can see at the bottom of the screen and i will then uh, ask questions to the speakers and now without further ado i will give the floor to um, Vicky Mosterin Perdiguero, Managing Director of Innovate Europe, who will give a few words before starting. So Vicky, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin, and hello, everybody. Um, indeed, Vicky Mosterin, I'm Managing Director of Greenovate Europe. Uh, Greenovate Europe is a member-based association uh, based uh, in Brussels, but with members from more than 14 European countries. Uh, we are a sustainable innovation expert network. Uh, as Martin already announced, Greenovate is leading the replication activities in the Stardust uh, projects. And I'm today very delighted to welcome you all uh, to this webinar, which uh, we are organizing as part of the constant efforts that the Stardust cities have been making in the past years to become smarter, more inclusive, and more sustainable. Now, as you are all probably aware, the European Commission has launched a, a mission to achieve 100 climate neutral and smart European cities by 2030, which uh, select as uh, experimentation and innovation hubs. These cities are to represent role models, enabling all other European cities to follow their example by 2050. In fact, you know, everything happens in cities. They are the ending of the European economy, not only, but uh, main part of the ending of the European economy. And so the cities are the best place uh, today to be, to be the early adopters of policies in order to achieve climate neutrality. And so that by implementing, implementing effective solutions, cities can deliver a whole range of benefits to their communities such as, for example, decreased air and noise, noise pollution, less traffic jams, lower energy bills, and also lower energy poverty as a consequence, and all of which will result on healthier lifestyles for, for all of us at the end, for the communities. Uh, as well as they are of this uh, unprecedented need to act to face the climate challenge and improve the well-being of our populations, the cities from the Stardust uh, Horizon 2020 project have accepted this challenge and they are already paving the way to become exemplary models of a smart, highly efficient and city, citizen-oriented cities. Five of the Stardust uh, cities confirm their strong motivation and their firm will to follow this ambitious mission by uh, submitting expressions of interest to be among the 100 selected cities to achieve climate neutrality by 2030 and become so ambassadors of the European Green Deal that you all know. Today, as Martin already announced, four of the Stardust cities will present their climate action plans and we'll discuss issues such as funding, solutions, technologies, and poli policies. These cities, Martin has already mentioned, are Cosani, Club, Pamplona, and Tampere. Uh, to finish, in Stardust, as in Greenovate Europe, we believe that mutual learning, exchange of best practices, and a strong cooperation are key to accelerate the green transition and to create an environment in which innovation can thrive. With this, uh, I will finish and let uh, the, give the floor back to, to Martin, who will present the first speaker. And I thank you very much, all of you, for your attention. And I give the floor now to Martin so you can uh, present uh, 
Kosani, I believe. Thank you very much, Vicky, for the for the welcome words. Uh, and uh, now I will give the floor to uh, Nula Tompolidou, uh, the Vice Mayor of the Municipality of Kozani, responsible for technical projects and services. The city of Kozani is actually a very interesting case because it has been going through a very heavy industrial transition. So we are very happy to hear from you today. So Nula, the floor is yours to give a few, few welcome words. Thank you very much. They are all it is my great pleasure to welcome the Stardust event for climate neutrality. On behalf of the municipality of Kozani, I would like to thank the organizers for this great opportunity to host this interesting meeting. My intention is to give you an idea of Kozani's path to climate neutrality and digital transformation by 2030. Municipality of Kozani is the seat of Western Macedonia one of the most carbon intensive regions in Europe. Kozani is also the seat of the University of Western Macedonia and is an administrative and commercial center. Almost 32% of the total number of students are studying here, while Kozani hosts over 30% of the total workforce of the region. Until recently, Kozani, the current installed energy capacity was over 2,770 megawatts. In brief, to mention some of the major infrastructures of the, or the, of the area, Kozani hosts a new university campus, high voltage power grids, large scale solar parks and wind farms, while Ignatia Motorway and Philippos Airport supplement the transformation networks. During these years, Kozani was a leader in complex flagship investments, such as the first district heating system in Greece, the first integrated waste management regional system in Greece, as well as an architectural masterpiece building which hosts the municipal library. In our portfolio of projects included bioclimatic school complex, energy retrofitting invest interventions, immobility pilots and high-end broadband networks. The next generation of municipal investments concerns a public-private partnership, which will transform Kozani to a national hub of sustainability and innovation, including the construction of science dissemination center and technology museum and school buildings also. Since July 2021, Kozani declared climate emergency and set the goal to be the first climate neutral and smart city in Greece by 2030. To that end, Kozani submit a proposal to the EU mission on climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. And so did all your cities, these cities of Star Stardust, which makes us all unite under this common approach. We want our cities, greatly inspired by our work with Stardust project to become climate neutral and smart by 2030. We are convinced that our cooperation and mutual exchange of ideas and best practices can only foster our development while our potential common approach for funding opportunities may only re reinforce our efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end my speech. I wish you all the, the most successful meeting and we declare our support to our common project. It was nice meeting you all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nula, for, uh, for your kind words. And so now we can move to the Kozani's presentation. Um, it will, I guess it will be Dimitris, uh, the head of mayor office, starting our presenting. So we'll just wait for Dimitris to get ready. Let me know, Dimitris, when you are ready, and I can stop sharing my screen. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so I uh, will give the floor to Dimitris Kakulides, who is the head of mayor's office of the municipality of Kozani, and will present uh, the plan of Kozani to become climate neutral. So I just stop sharing my screen and you should be able to share yours as of now. And now we can see it. Okay. Hello to everyone. Hello. 
My name is Dimitris Kaklidis, head of Major's Office, and I will present you our vision for 2030. The municipality of Kozani is the largest municipality of the region of Western Macedonia, and city of Kozani is the largest urban area in the region of Western Macedonia. As you can see on the map, our municipality is a natural geographical and logistics hub in the region of Western Macedonia and the Western Balkans. Western Macedonia is one of Europe's most carbon intensive region in transition. You can see in the diagram the causality between energy production from Ignite, population and labor market. Reduction in energy production from Ignite caused reduction in population and increase in unemployment rates. So the lignification is a huge threat for our region but a huge opportunity also. And we want to take the opportunity. Our major infrastructures in our municipality, motorway, Egnatia motorway, Philippos airport, high voltage power grids infrastructures, our new university campus near the city of Kozani, and several investments of solar parks make Kozani a leader in power production in Greece. Also, three flagship investments. Our, three, our district heating system, the greatest energy project in Greek local administration. The first integrated waste management system in Greece. This system concerns the whole region of Western Macedonia and uh, our new municipal library of Kozani. These are uh, integrated climate neutrality and smart city projects, such as the first bioclimatic school complex with renewable energy applications and technologies, installment of PV panels on rooftops for further aim at enabling schools to be more energy efficient. An e-mobility project with public power corporation since 2013. And the, progress, and, and, uh, and the project in progress uh, concerns our collaboration with the University of Western Macedonia in order to set up a LoRa-based network in Kozani and implement various smart city IoT applications that emerge from our strategic plan for digital transformation. Next generation of our municipal investments. Last week, national government approved our proposal for a public-private partnership investment. This investment includes the Science Dissemination Center and Technology Museum, Technopolis, and several education buildings infrastructures. Our networking. Kozani is a Green City Accord member, is a convenient of, a convenient of mayor's member, and we are accepted as a new ECLA member. As our mayor said, our aim is to make Kozani a national hub of sustainability and innovation. And so we reach European mission. European mission, 100 climate neutral and smart cities. We submit our proposal and we aim to be climate neutral by 2030, 20 years earlier than the European Union's declared goal for 2050. Our strategic priorities for our climate action plan for 2030. 
stationary energy, buildings, equipment and facilities, transportation, waste and, wa and wastewater management, energy production from renewable energy sources, land, land use and forestry, and digital transition. All these priorities are in line with the European Green Deal, the Green City Accord, and 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So thank you all for your attention. And I think we will continue with a promo video. Yes, thank you very much, Dimitris. I will share the video that Kozani has prepared actually about their objective to, be, to become climate neutral. So I will just play it. We saw our land changing. We took steps, big and fast. We have supplied Greece with energy for over 60 years. In Kozani, district heating is available for the last 30 years. It is the greatest local government's energy project in Greece. We knew that decarbonization would be the next step. The planet is reacting now. Climate change affects us all. This is the beginning of a new era. The entire world is shifting to clean energy. We will take a leap into the future. We will break new ground again. We have declared our climate neutrality. Our aim is to become one of Europe's 100 climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. We don't lose track of the future. We build it together. To have the life we deserve. so that no more young people leave our land. Life is in need of a change. Our planet needs it. It is necessary for our children. They want a perspective. They want green spaces. They want clean air. This is their heritage. So that was the video, thank you very much. I think it's very nice. And I don't know if there are any questions at this point to Dimitris. Maybe I will have just a quick question. 2030 seems quite uh, quite early because it's in seven, eight years. So it's at the same time early and ambitious. So maybe um, I would like to know what you think will be the biggest challenge to actually achieving um, this objective. Perhaps you can repeat, Martin? Yes. Yeah, I was saying that 2030 is, um, seems to be very early. It's in seven or eight years. So it will require a lot of actions in the next few years. 
What do you think is the maybe the biggest challenge that you will have to face in reaching um, the objective? Um, can you hear me? Perhaps maybe I can I can step okay. in. Martin. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anis. Um, because we were heavily involved in the preparation of the proposal yeah. <laughs> for the 100 uh, climate uh, cities. So uh, I think that during our discussions, the main issue raised was uh, funding. So uh, raising and leveraging all this uh, funding required and maybe involving uh, citizens, both in the construction, but also in engaging in the activities is another um, important pillar. I wouldn't uh, spend too much time on bureaucracy, etc., which is a huge problem. But I guess that you know uh, um, we can mobilize uh, the resources, and the municipality can really uh, overcome these problems. But funding, I would say, remains number one. Okay, thank you very much. Indeed, funding is uh, crucial in reaching the objectives. Um, I think we'll have time to cover these points as well during the discussion at the end. So um, I will give the floor now to Alian from the city of Cluj will uh, present the Cluj objectives uh, towards carbon neutrality. Yeah. So Adrian, I will just stop sharing the <coughs> screen and then the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. But just one one question for Kozani before I, yes. I start, because I was, uh, it's not really, maybe it's a bit off topic, but uh, it was listed in their presentation about the science museum. I've seen that they're, they're uh, planning on uh, building a science and technology museum. And I was uh, very curious on uh, how they, um, uh, how they're on track and uh, if they're uh, just in the face of uh, just a project or they've started some, need, some uh, more concrete measures on that. And uh, if they found some uh, interesting uh, sources of financing, because we try to do the same inclusion, science and technology museum uh and uh it's one of the most important uh, objectives in terms of education for for Cluj now and uh, we plan on having a uh, design competition to see exactly the the future design of the facility and then uh, to secure some funding but we have to still to see uh if it's eligible under the eu financing uh, structures or we have to seek for for other kinds of financing But we can discuss it also later, so it's no, uh, it's no problem. Yeah, I, I have the impression that this is part of the decarbonization process of the region. And uh, but for details on where it is funded from, I think the municipality can answer later on. But as you okay. said, later on, I think it's better now. In terms, yeah. I see we, Martin we looking at his the, uh, watch. Uh, so mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> okay, great. I'm gonna share my screen now. So. Great. So the case for a green, resilient Cluj metropolitan area. Um, we're actually the second biggest city in, in Romania, and uh, we're the informal capital of Romania's most forward-looking region, as we say, Transylvania. We lie in the northwestern part of the country, uh, more towards the border with Hungary and uh, the western part of Europe. And um, We've been awarded as the best local administration in, in Romania, and we've also been shortlisted for European Capital of Innovation in uh, 2020. Um, we are also, as the World Bank said, the fastest growing city in Europe, and um, the city with the largest concentration of uh, IT programmers in, in Europe, so which is quite, quite interesting. And we pride ourselves with the fact that we have the best quality of life among the cities in uh, in Romania, and we strive to be one of the best cities to live in, in uh, at least uh, the eastern part of Europe. Um, what we did to prepare for 2030 it was to have a, a strategy for the 2030 and also extended 2050. And um, it's the integrated urban development strategy for, uh, for Cluj metropolitan area. Um, and also we had uh, just released an updated sustainable urban mobility plan for 2021-2030. Uh, together with the University of Babesboy and the Faculty for 
political sciences and administrative studies, we have drafted and finalized the G digital transformation strategy for the upcoming years. And we have a very interesting platform for debates, the Center for Civic Innovation and Imagination, which uh, on which platform most of the projects of the important projects of the city are debated and are um, uh, in a participatory manner with uh, the, the citizens of Cluj Napoca. Um, for going uh, greener and resilient and uh, as the scope of this conversation, we, we focus now on the presentation on at least three things. The um, electrical and green transport, uh, green infrastructure and uh, energy and uh, efficiency, energy efficiency in, uh, in our uh, metropolitan area. Um, as we are not at the first uh, presentation of uh, Cluj in, in the Stardust framework, we all know that we are very focused on uh, electric infrastructure, electric um, uh, transport infrastructure. We have uh, been uh, investing uh, quite a lot in the last 10 years, roughly 200 million euros in uh, electric buses, trams and uh, trolley buses. And uh, the existing diesel buses are all Euro 6. And uh, the, the mayor said that by 2030, at least in the city of Cluj-Napoca, the commitment is to have 100% green fleet. But moreover, uh, the major transport projects that we have now, and uh, they're in different stages, um, are very important and one of the biggest uh, investment projects in, in Europe. Uh, as of now. So the, the biggest one and the most important is the subway, the metro system that uh, has been, um, the project has been finalized, the technical designs and is now uh, tendered and uh, the offers should be submitted by the 9th of May. And uh, by the 9th of May, we should know if there is a contractor that is uh, interested to build uh, our first uh, metro uh, line in Cluj-Napoca. We would be the second city in Romania after Bucharest, Bucharest that has a, a metro line. Uh, the cost is it's huge, it's 1.3 billion euros. Um, the first 300 million euros are uh, assured through the recovery and resilience facility of the EU Commission. And um, also uh, next to this uh, major investment, we have the metropolitan train that's roughly 200 million euros, and also a uh, bypass um, 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 on um, infrastructure for the bypass of the city uh, to the southern part of it for the for the private cars. Um, on the other hand, um, we want to grow greener, and uh, we plan on investing also a lot of money in. Uh, the green infrastructure in the metropolitan area, also including a metropolitan green belt. Uh, we have about 14 large investments. Most of them are going to be parks and recre recreational facilities. And they are in different uh, stages of uh, realization. Uh, the picture that you have see, you see now is, uh, one of the, is one of the latest pictures that we have on uh, the Somesh River. Uh, the rehabilitation has uh, started last year and uh, the rehabilitation is ongoing and the aim is to bring back the city to the people, the river to the people, so that it would be more usable, more friendly with the citizens and it would be, of course, used by, by the citizens and not just a technical canal for the uh, hydro plants um, that are on, uh, on this river. Um, it's one of the major projects of our strategy to have a green corridor along the Somesh River, which lies from uh, west to east of our city. And it should be at least 30 kilometers of uh, walkable and uh, velo infrastructure from uh, one canyon to another flowing through the city of Cluj-Napoca. Also the largest part in the city, about 54 hectares, is now being uh, planned and designed. We had an international contest for solutions for that park. Uh, it's been won by a company in Brussels. And um, 
they're going to present their final design this year and hopefully by next year they're gonna uh, tender it and uh, start uh, the the construction works um also uh, we had the uh, bid and uh, to be the among 100 climate neutral cities by 2030 we have been shortlisted at least uh, among the cities that uh, have uh, bid it from uh, from Romania, we are on the finalists. We have to see the evaluation forward how it goes. We have a tree planting program, uh, 100,000 new trees planted by 2030, and at least 100 hectares of new green spaces uh, built by uh, 2030. Also, green corridors, as I said, along the banks of the rivers in uh, in Cluj metropolitan area, but mostly along the um, the Somesh River. Um, this zoom in represents one of the more interesting projects that we had, the first of the forest parks in Romania, 40 hectares of peri-urban forest that we have turned it into a leisure space. And uh, it was not that much of an investment, about um, 200 euros uh, actual project and uh, only 50,000 euros in equipment, but we have managed to bring this 40 hectare uh, forest into the public circuit. Uh, in terms of, of efficiency, uh, the city is, um, let's say, all in on investing on renewable energy sources for the public buildings, for the deep renovation of schools and uh, also the hospitals in the city. And uh, there is now a national program that fin finances uh, the retrofitting of photovoltaic panels on public buildings, and um, also for the for the um, uh, lighting system, the efficiency of the lighting system. The city owns also a company that provides uh, heating for uh, about thirty thousand apartments in the city, and it's been um, constantly renewed, which is. Uh, good that uh, the city has also this in their strategy to connect as many public buildings as possible to decentralized heating network so there's a constant investment in uh, in this facility and uh, in terms of smart city um, we have roughly 250 administrative services that are available online um, we had the digital transformation strategy that's been drafted with the a university and uh, with the social and administrative science faculty, as I said before. Um, the mayor has an advisory council of entrepreneurship and innovation in IT, and it is formed by uh, the most representative uh, representative um, people from the IT industry in Inclusion Napoca. And uh, we have also um, uh, there's also a new office in uh, the, the city hall, which is the local office for digital transformation. It's now, let's say, like a pilot. It should uh, be seen how how it performs and if it uh, if it uh, it's up to the task that it has to transform digitally transform the city of Cluj Napoca. Um, I'm waiting for your questions. Maybe after the the presentations, we can have a round of. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Answers. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you. Uh, you can see there's a question in the question uh, box, but I, yeah, as you said, I think we can keep it for the for the final part. So I will ask it later. And um, now I think we can go on to the next presentation, um, which is um, which will be done by uh, Koldo uh, from um, Technalia Research and Innovation. So Koldo, normally you should be able to share your screen. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, so I know your agenda was quite busy, so thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin, for, for this invitation. Uh, I'm Koldo Rutia, a researcher in the Urban Transformation Lab uh, in Technalia. In Technalia, uh, it's, it's uh, indeed a big house and, and we cover, uh, our areas cover a wide and transversal expertise. Uh, our team is mainly dedicated to urban transformation processes and the technologies entailed to it. And uh, of course, this includes the two main topics uh, of this EOI and cities mission, which are uh, climate neutrality of cities and smart cities movement. 
uh, with within this this expression of interest, Pamplona contacted us uh, regarding uh, this, this, the potential submission and and to consider it. Uh, and I will try to to briefly present today our process and also the the CCAP development uh, from the city. So, yeah, one sec. So yeah, that's that's what I will try to present. Uh, first, uh, the current climate neutrality policies uh, in, in Pamplona, and then uh, how this connects to the CCAP. And uh, after just releasing the CCAP, uh, we knew the, the, the climate neutral cities mission, a smart cities mission, and uh, everything kind of uh, matched perfectly uh, for Pamplona's time, timeline in that sense, because they ended with the the planning phase, and then they could show all that to, to the Commission. In terms of current uh, climate neutrality policies, uh, uh, the, the strategic office has been doing uh, an effort during last years to, to provide those integrated policies. They drafted an urban agenda for, the, for 2030. Uh, there's also a sustainable urban mobility plan uh, for the metropolitan area and also the metropolitan ASC for public services, they also had an, a climate neutrality plan for 2030. So that everything converges somehow into, into this, uh, this CCAP 2030 or in a local uh, format is called the Energy Transition and Climate Change Strategy for Pamplona 2030. But in the end is probably similar to most of yeah, European CCAPs, uh, both, uh, as you know, the, the C uh, letter from CCAP, also facing uh, this time the climate adaptation uh, field uh, on top of as well the, the mitigation part. Uh, if we start first with the diagnosis of that CCAP, uh, the energy balance of the city, I won't uh, give much details, just a quick overview. But uh, yeah, in this sense, uh, Pamplona in 2018, which is our, which are the, the latest numbers on the CCAP, was very, very much dependent and still is dependent on petroleum products. Uh, more than half of those emissions are attached to, to petroleum and 60% of it. And then uh, if we bring that to, to sectors, uh, the transport and mobility sector is the main contributor to to, to that kind of pollution. Uh, at that time, just uh, not, not even a 10% of, of the final energy consumption of the city came from renewables. That is rapidly increasing, uh, of course, because we have new regulations in Spain that is supporting that. Also, uh, renewable costs are decreasing. And uh, more recently, uh, we don't have still numbers, but we suspect or we expect that the, the, this war situation between Ukraine uh, in Ukraine probably will 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 even boost more uh, the, the implementation of renewables in Europe uh, overall. Uh, if we bring that uh, analysis to the city council sphere, uh, we see that that number shift uh, greatly and that's mainly because uh, the city council is not responsible for transport uh, or just the fleet. Uh, the transport fleet for municipal workers. And in that sense, electricity and natural gas are the, the most contributing sources. Uh, and if we, and, and that's because they are mainly attached to uh, heat all municipal buildings and facilities, and of course the public lighting part. Uh, I just wanted to show that if, uh, at least that's what the model said, the, the energy, the urban energy model said, uh, if we continue with the same trend without uh, no more energy efficiency measures or extra renewable generations are implemented, the business as usual scenario uh, would bring us to a cut on an average of 28% of emissions in 2030. Uh, and of course, this is this is something, but it's not enough, uh, and even less if we are of uh, targeting carbon neutrality by by that year. Uh, also, and as I said, uh, on behalf of mitigation, uh, on top of mitigation measures, 
uh, we are looking on CCAP to the other climate adaptation uh, measures. And as we can see in this, in this diagram, uh, all of the potential impacts are getting even worse and are rapidly increasing. Uh, I think the, the, the only one that is not that bad is that it will freeze less in Pamplona, but all the rest of them, they, they will be much higher. Duration of heat waves, uh, number of hot days, uh, the length of summer, and, and very important for Pamplona, uh, the, the flooding uh, events, uh, cloud burst, uh, that, that, that is uh, hitting uh, almost every second, every third year in Pamplona, which is something that is it was happening uh, uh, in the old days, like every 15 years, something like that, and it's becoming a, a big problem. So after all this analysis, uh, it came the, the, the planning part of it. Uh, in Pamplona, Pamplona uh, identified key actions to deliver uh, uh, the biggest reduction, greenhouse gas reduction uh, possible which are those objectives uh, in the in the left of the diagram mainly 64 reduction of greenhouse gases compared to 2005 and then increasing both energy efficiency and renewables bringing energy poverty to zero uh, and then all the adaptation measures that uh, it will be maybe part of another webinar because it's a, a big thing as well this plan uh, went through a thorough um, process, participation process, uh, is well coordinated and well consensual with the local community and it's structured under, under five strategic objectives and 24 uh, lines of action. Uh, probably as many other uh, CCAPs, uh, uh, Pamplona's objectives in this sense for 2030 are focused on the energy uh, retrofit of buildings and, and the renaturalization of the urban environment. Secondly, on the carbonizing the local energy systems. Thirdly, on a better and more sustainable mobility model. And then in a fourth point, uh, very much focus on municipal services, trying to improve that uh, in a more sustainable and circular way. And finally, uh, in the fifth, uh, objective, uh, all the, the soft measures that have ha, have to facilitate uh, all that, both within the key stakeholders and organizations, but also in the culture of Pamplona society. I wanted to bring some diagrams just to check uh, with no specific details that those objectives were uh, aligned with uh, the general objectives of the, the CCAP and all the 24 lines of action entailing each several projects for the five key, key areas. And that uh, each of those uh, is also attached to a timeline, timeline. Is, is not very detailed, but at least a yearly timeline and uh, an average estimation of cost for each for each action, which is indeed it's been very helpful for the for the estimations of how much carbon neutrality or the advanced uh, until 2030 could cost to Pamplona and 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 then check how much uh, financing uh, is needed to. To, to, to be to be achieved. Uh, also, there is a governance model that is getting now in place, a monitoring and evaluation system with uh, attached indicators and follow-up indicators. Uh, but overall, uh, I would like to, to just uh, keep the message that uh, within the expected results of the CCAP, uh, Pamplona was targeting to reduce uh, regarding the 2005 levels at 64% of their greenhouse gas emissions. And this is, of course, changing a bit uh, the energy modeling. Uh, and, and there is probably less natural gas and petroleum uh, products. And then, of course, uh, going towards electrification and active mobility, and then uh, a more, uh, more evident presence of, of renewables. And 
all this, uh, of course, uh, was a big effort. It took uh, a lot of months and a lot of uh, workshops and, and, and discussions, but it was the perfect ground before the EU mission's new format of the, of the, of the European Commission uh, came up into the stage. Uh, and in this sense, uh, it was perfect timing for Pamplona. Uh, uh, I, I guess you all know, but uh, the EU missions is the new format that uh, the EU Commission intends to target uh, the greatest challenges for the continent. Uh, and the, the Climate Neutral and Smart Cities mission, or the Cities mission, as, as it's so-called, uh, is, is trying to deliver 100 climate neutral and smart cities by 2030, but also as much as, as, as important as that is to inspire all other cities to follow uh, those, those 100 by 2050. Um, we know all the challenges and, and the opportunities, we'll try to leverage that, but it will be quite a lot of money um, for, for, this, for this mission. Uh, there is a mission platform, Net Zero Cities, that will try to provide support to all those cities. Uh, there will be a binding document, not legally, but uh, with, both with the European Commission and, uh, and the local community of each city, a climate city contract, to, to try to, to, to fix that commitment. Uh, and then a lot of knowledge, support, and regional and national networks to 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 support all this process now we, within this uh, city's mission i will try to provide uh, a, a few flashes of, of of our of our workflow within the, the the expression of interest and first in analysis uh, step uh, we try to assess externally from technalia uh, the ccap recently released we redeveloped the urban energy model uh, to contrast CCAP results, both in diagnosis and action plan terms. And our first conclusion was that the CCAP was ambitious enough. It was well participated, well developed. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it was a good document and we could trust it. And uh, after that, uh, we tried to create a 2030 scenario uh, and check the evolving development rates of the key specific actions of, of, of the CCAP. Let's say, for example, like electrification, uh, retrofitting, uh, yearly trends. Uh, and with all that, try to see if there was some room for, for improvement towards carbon neutrality in 2030. We checked that there was very small room the, the, for that. The, the plan was very ambitious in all terms. So we agreed with the municipality of Pamplona to keep on track with the CCAP strategy because it's ambitious enough according to city potential and status right now. It was well co-developed with the key local stakeholders and reached consensus with the local community and is uh, well updated because of course it's, it's from last year. So, so data, all, all the effort just came in the right moment. And our common position for the EOI was to provide an honest description to the EU Commission on Pamplona's current situation and its 2030 ambitions, uh, targeting that 64% reduction from, from the base year. And then we will see what we do with, with the rest of the missions. So uh, we started developing and gathering support uh, from the mayor and other institutions, local institutions for, for, for the, the EOI submission. And just a few flashes. Uh, the scope we took is uh, taking just Pamplona city boundary and not completely as a metropolitan area. Um, then, because it, it was much easier in terms of time and coordination, but of course it will affect very much to the metropolitan area and we will have to be coordinated in the coming years as it is the CICA uh, on itself. Regarding the current policies, uh, as I was stating in the first uh, slide, we just wanted to show the strategic office's uh, work during the last year. Uh, all plans, initiatives, uh, innovation, research was targeting this. So that was just to reflect what's, what was going on in Pamplona. And then in the current, in, in, the key, in the key section of the EOI, the ambition for climate neutrality, uh, we tried to, to give this approach. We took the net zero ambition under the second scope of the greenhouse gas protocol 
uh, first scope we we understood it was not uh, ambitious and the third scope is completely out of scope because it's covering all life cycle uh, assessment goods of goods uh, uh, enjoyed in the city which is completely out of scope now for all cities i think copenhagen for example now it's going in 2025 to carbon neutrality net zero under scope two so uh, they will be probably pioneers and maybe some some Finnish cities, maybe big, uh, sorry, our colleague from Tampere can give some hints on that, but we are not there in Pamplona or any Spanish city uh, right now. Uh, a second uh, a second idea was to trust on the just release checkup, as I, would, uh, as I said, and then explain very well uh, both horizontal and vertical measures included there. And how that was contributing to carbon neutrality, or at least advancing to it, and then what to do with the residual greenhouse gas emissions. That that thirty six percent was targeted by offsetting and carbon sequestration connected to the Navarra regional area. We knew that uh, the the EOI was um, was requesting to do as much as possible within the city boundary, but uh, there is no empty space in Pamplona municipality because we're surrounded by other municipalities. And in that sense, we felt that it was nice to connect it to, to, to the region because the, there is a, a, a very pioneer uh, technological hub uh, on renewables and electrification and also in rural management and all the carbon sequestration measures that uh, we could connect uh, to that. Regarding investments, everything was mostly gathered in 2030 CCAP, so it was just to reflect that. And the same uh, checking on the good alignment uh, with no national regional strategies and also the climate, uh, national, uh, climate neutrality national networks as cities 2030 uh so so we just try to reflect uh, as 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 best as possible the, the the situation and then we brainstorm a little bit on potential barriers and assistance needs probably there will be need of new profiles with municipality if this comes up uh, we'll see regarding financing uh, and as uh, the previous speaker said there are ha really high ambitions uh, janice uh, for 2030 i agree with that Regarding technology, we need solid alternatives. I think we have them, but uh, there is some resistance to avoid natural gas currently uh, and electrification with through heat pumps. Also, fossil fuels on transportation, we need cheaper EVs if we really want to electrify what we, we want to cover with active mobility. And then in terms of engagement, it's really key and probably the biggest challenge uh, to me, the mobilization of the private sector and and the citizenship. And uh, just uh, last couple of slides, next steps will be mid-April. Uh, we will know the, the names of, of, of the 100 cities that will uh, become labeled with this, within this program. Uh, and Net Zero Cities uh, platform project uh, intends to provide support in many different uh, the fields uh, first with climate neutral city contracts, but also with metrics, uh, one stop shops, uh, replication and upscaling within your cities and with other cities, trying to provide and deliver systemic innovation in cities, financing, social innovation, then uh, a catalog, thorough catalog on, on, on technical expertise, uh, also technical expertise for those. Uh, uh, cities that will uh, bring uh, or, or try to make pilots uh, from those 100 cities there will be further further calls on that and that's what will uh, net zero cities will try to do uh, we are signalia we are part of the consortium but we don't have anything to to do with the selection process but we we will try to provide some expertise on delivering that systemic innovation in cities because uh, as we can imagine deliver uh, this level of ambition is something really new in cities. So municipalities really have to make some, some adjustments some municipal transformation to, to deliver this, this new ambition, uh, ambitions. And we are also supporting the, that knowledge repository from our diverse um, uh, 
uh, expertise on mobility, electric uh, energy, uh, waste management, circular economy, built environment. So the cities uh, have a, a, a static knowledge repository they can enjoy, enjoy depending on their interests, and then maybe uh, provide some ad hoc uh, uh, mentoring uh, after that. So we'll see how, how it goes in the next month of April. And yeah, thank you very much for listening and really glad to participate today, listen other speakers and contribute to the round uh, table discussion after that. Thank you very much, Cordova. I think it was very insightful. And um, any questions, we can ask them afterwards. Um, yeah. We are running a bit behind, behind schedule. So I will give the floor now to Anna from uh, the of Tampere. I know that Anna hasn't been involved in the in the proposal process, but um, her colleagues were not available, so she proposed that she would do the presentation herself. So Anna, I will um, I will give the floor to you. Um, Thank uh, you. Kodo, maybe you can stop uh, sharing your screen. I, I can do it. Okay. Yeah. And now, yeah, you. now Anna, you should be able to to share your screen. Yes. So now I guess it's working. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for being with us. And now I give, I give the floor to you. No problem. How how many minutes did I have? <laughs> I think I was supposed. I to mean, if, if you go a little bit of if, if, if you go a little bit over time, it's not a problem. So oh, okay. just do it as okay. you as you as you foresaw. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Have a, hello, everyone, and, and good afternoon from Tampere, Finland. And my name is Anna Vilholand. I work as project coordinator in Status Project. I've been working in status since, uh, well, about four years now. So not right from, from where it started, but year after that. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tampere's um, willingness to join this mission. So, yes, we are on a mission <laughs> to become carbon neutral. But um, this uh, goes way back to the 1990s when, when the city started its um, first um, citizen engagement actions. So uh, this has been a long tradition, but um, in city strategies, we have had the carbon neutrality goal for 2030 for five years now. And in this, application, our vision was uh, to ensure a sustainable growth of Tampere without compromising health and well-being, equity and urban biodiversity of the city. So it's not, um, not an easy task, but <laughs> anyway, um, I guess we need to um, have high standards in, in this point. So here you can see what it means um, that we will be carbon neutral. So we will uh, have 80% reduction in total uh, CO2 emissions, and then we will compensate the rest. So now I'm losing my mouse. Where did it go? Oh no, this is not easy. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. <clears throat> No, it's not working at all. Yeah, the mouse seems to have disappeared. OK, so, now? Uh, now, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, what we want to do is we want to keep everyone on board. Um, so it's going to be a really challenging thing um, to make it possible for everyone to, to join this, uh, because we need everybody on board, all, all the citizens and all the institutions. Um, so I think in Tampere we see that um, regardless of one's uh, socioeconomic uh, situation or neighborhood or age or gender, um, they should be able to uh, live a climate resilient lifestyle and, and make choices that are best suited for, for themselves. So, and we need to do this together, um, we can't work alone, we are um, or, or the city is working together with uh, universities and companies and communities. So that's how we are going to tackle this thing. And um, then a little bit about our uh, emission trends. 
um, like I showed you the, the diagram before, um, the greenhouse gas emissions have been declining since 2010, but uh, fairly stable since 2015. So it's always easy to, to start uh, something and then in the end it gets harder and harder to, to still find some, some effective ways to, to have, more, have even less and less um, carbon dioxide in the air. So, but we're uh, believing that our investments that are uh, taking place uh, will change this because especially in energy, we are um, working on, on several fields. And our uh, sector specific vision for 2030 is that, uh, well, we will first of all grow primarily uh, into public transport zones and regional centers. Um, we will uh, build there where people already have ability to use public transport or tram. And also we will um, of course try to um, make even more and more people to walk or cycle or, or take the bus or tram. And then uh, all the new construction will be at the zero energy level. And, and of course the other housing should be really uh, effective, energy effective. And then our, our renewable energy will amount to 80%. And we will uh, have consumption, sustainable consumption that is based on circular economy and uh, urban nature and structures. Uh, that will bind carbon. <clears throat> so we can't cut all our forests and we need to have our, our parks nearby. <clears throat> so, okay, now I lost my mouse again. It's here, sorry. I don't know why this is so hard now. <laughs> Um, there. Ah, yeah, no. we found it perfect. <laughs> no, <clears throat> yeah, our, our tools. Um, we have also SECUP as uh, well as Pamplona and others that was made in 2019 and then Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan last year. And then um, our roadmap, Carbon Neutral Tampere roadmap. Uh, it dates back to um, 2020. And then um, we also are, are working on biodiversity roadmap that will be finished this year. And all the plants that are in the roadmap, they are monitored through an open platform that can be found online. And it's called Tampere Climate and Environmental Watch. And um, then also we have uh, annual climate budget uh, that is an important uh, governance and transparency tool. And there we make it visible how, how, how um, what kind of uh, financial resources are allocated for the measures. So, <clears throat> and also, um, <laughs> It's um, last but not least, we run also several projects like Stardust. Uh, we also run uh, other Horizon 2020 projects like Susili Show and Recreate. And they help us to um, pilot, have pilots and, and learn from those experiences and even uh, gain new ideas and expertise. And here's our um, road map that has uh, six themes and several actions. And at the moment we are updating this so that we are gathering even um, more and more actions that will take place in, in forthcoming years. Um, as we have noticed, as we calculated uh, how much um, reductions we can get through this um, first, First um, roadmap 
version and that uh, showed us that we still need to develop better ways to reduce even uh, more. So now we're uh, updating this. And now um, I would just like to welcome you all <laughs> into our Tampere uh, Smart City Week that will take place in June. Uh, then you can see visit our city and, and see how we're doing things in, in smart city. <laughs> and the registration is now open. So if you have time, please and join us in June in Tampere. That's all from my side, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, uh, for this uh, intervention. Um, it, was, it has been very insightful. Um, thank you even more, knowing that you haven't been involved in the, in the proposal and you still propose to participate. So we are very grateful for that. <laughs> no problem. And now uh, there's an open space for any questions so any city might have. So maybe everybody can just open the camera and can have an informal, informal discussion. I can see there was one question in the, in the question box. Um, Janis already answered it for Kozani. So maybe I can ask uh, Adrian. So he also gives the point of Cluj. Um, Krista Sorry asked that. Kozani and Cluj projects seem to be strongly municipality driven. Are local companies investing or participating to the projects? Uh, 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 at the end, you can answer. Likewise, in, in Kozani, it's also included it's uh, city driven, at least by now. But um, it's more of an uh, um, let's say, uh, follow the leader and see the example. And then I think, as uh, Yanni said, uh, many more would follow. But also, we, we try to, to see how administratively we can impose some uh, concrete measures. We have uh, also a roadmap that we say that future buildings should be at least uh, near zero emission buildings and things like that. And uh, the the companies and the private uh, owners would uh, somehow follow, but the idea is that to have the example of the city that it can be done. The new investments, for example, in uh, energy efficiency, uh, the um, energy measures, and uh, the investment in uh, renewable energies, in uh, retrofitting old buildings, in uh, um, going more green. It's important to see the example and then the, the citizen to follow. On the other hand, as um, our colleagues from Tampere said, it's important to, to be also a just transition to uh, these uh, climate resilient cities because we have also different uh, uh, categories of, of people in, in the city, of incomes in the city. Not everybody is uh, uh, very eager to make this transformation because of the cost that uh, it uh, implies. Of course, not everybody can afford an electric car, not everybody can afford retrofitting their uh, own house with uh, uh, renewable energy sources and things like that. So it should be a just transition. It should be uh, uh, also um, incentivized and it also should be uh, of course, as kind of a category of people should be helped, and also the businesses help to achieve this climate neutrality, and not by themselves. Thank you very much, Adrian. I don't know if somebody wants to react to that. All right. So, all right. Um, I wrote down a few questions, so maybe I can start, and I can give it for Adrian because I'm sure he has some as well. Um, so um, my question was, I could see that in Cluj you organize some sort of platform uh, for debate, so uh, it's on Facebook. So how does it work? Basically, uh, people can write their ideas or um, they can reach out to the city to this debate and somehow give their opinions or ideas or how is it actually organized? Well, it's also a physical space at the Urban Cultural Center Casino, the, the Casino Urban Cultural Center. and. Um, every important um, strategy or every important project to be developed, project to be developed uh, is um, 
somehow presented to the public and uh, it is uh, debated through a number of uh, uh, debates. For example, when we launched the, uh, the idea for the uh, the biggest park in the city, the 54 hectare parks, uh, the East Park. It actually was um, a demand of the civil society, but the city has uh, taken on the, the challenge and uh, we have um, conducted debates on, on the public uh, discussions on, for example, the theme of the design, you know, because uh, we have uh, concluded that we need more uh, green spaces, of course, but what kind of green spaces? More natural green spaces, uh, more oriented to young people, to old people, or, you know, to bikers, to just leisure and things like that. So we managed to have um, terms of reference for the future design competition. And then we debated after the we had the uh, winning proposal, we also have a, a round of debates concerning the final design. So this is how it's, it actually works. And uh, we have, um, depending on, uh, on the time of the year and on the number of projects, we have a number of uh, debates starting in uh, early, let's say, February, March, and uh, with the most important projects that uh, are going to be implemented by the city. Or if we're talking about the strategy, the uh, SAMP or the integrated uh, development strategy, we had also uh, discussions and debates on each chapter of, uh, of this strategy. On the other hand, for example, 2022 is not that rich in new projects as an year, so we don't have that many debates because most of the uh, the projects that uh, I have been talking about uh, now they have uh, started so they're being uh, in different stages of implementation so we don't have that many debates now but there's a physical place so the urban cultural center casino and also a dedicated uh, web page where people can uh, um, put the questions and uh, send their uh, ideas Thank you very much, um, um, Adrian. Maybe uh, Dennis uh, has uh, any questions, some questions for um, the present cities, uh, which he would like them to respond on any kind of aspect, uh, because I know Yanis always uh, has good questions. And uh, yeah, so I, I will give you the floor. And I'm sure you have some, so. Yeah, I noted some uh, things down. Thank you for that, Martin. Um, to start with, uh, Colto, uh, with Pavlona, I meant, I, I, not, I noted down this 36% of remaining uh, emissions, and that seems to me quite a big number. Um, yeah. Is it possible that this could be stretched down a little bit by, I don't know, by raising some more uh, ambitious targets for the... Um, you know, for the emissions, or this is the best you can do, and that's absolutely uh, the saving. Yeah, that's that's what that's why we we wanted to the, to perform that that previous analysis and replicate the urban energy model because uh, we knew. Uh, well, I'm my hometown is Pamplona, so I know well that there's no room for for new green spaces that that. Uh, that can compensate or balance uh, carbon sequestration locally. And also there is limited space uh, for, for renewables because we don't have empty spaces to make uh, like uh, wind farms or solar farms within the municipality. Uh, so with that perspective, uh, what, what we wanted to do is to analyze very well uh, the room for improvement of, of mainly for, for renewables deployment. And we realized that it, it, it's really not possible to go much farther than that, maybe four five percent more, but not, not more than that, uh, at least by now. And in that sense, uh, what what we we want we didn't want to commit with something that we will not be able to deliver because I think it's not fair for commission nor for 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 the citizens. I think it creates uh, mistaken expectations and that can bring a bigger wave than just not being uh, selected uh, as one of those one hundred. And in that sense, we did that, and we will see because there was there was room for for it in the EOI, and and we just selected that it 
that remaining uh, emissions would be more than 20 percent is realistic is really ambitious uh, it, there is a lot of, a lot of money invested or forecasted to be invested on that and uh, and we felt that, that that's the, the best Pamplona can do by 2030. We'll see if it's enough for the commission. We expect also that there, is, there will be some geographical balance among the selected cities. And also, <clears throat> I heard Matthew Baldwin in the webinars that uh, they want cities in different stages of development. And in that sense, we thought that Pamplona with a very limited uh, area to both make uh, carbon sequestration or uh, renewable projects, uh, new projects is extremely limited. Uh, and somehow uh, I, we think uh, it can be a role model on that uh, with the very uh, difficult context situation. Uh, they also have to provide, those cities also have to deliver carbon neutrality. So in this sense, we think uh, it can be a, 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 a kind of city, let's say, and that uh, seems uh, an interesting case for the Commission. But of course, uh, it's, it, there is a lot of competition and, and expectations are just medium. Of course, I think even the fact that we discussed today is that we start from a rather secure position that we do not exactly compete uh, among yeah. each other. That's why we're at ease in, uh, yeah. you know, in uh, discussing all this. Um, however, on the other on the other hand, I think there is uh, quite a possibility uh, here, and I see I don't know about you, but I see the richness uh, in combining Stardust and the proposals for this uh, for this mission. Uh, whatever the outcome is, I think that it opens up new horizons for um, for our cities, and. Uh, even if a city is not selected, it might not meet, mean that much. Um, of course, you get this label and it's fantastic. But other than that, you don't get real cash <laughs> or at yeah. least not in the beginning. So, uh, so speaking of cash and money, I think funding is a very crucial question. And uh, maybe this is a, a question to all the cities. Uh, what would be your, I mean, in the application form, there was this very rough figure that we exposed and especially the the percentages that we mentioned for our cities so i i, I would be interested you know just uh, as a rough estimation of what would be the con the distribution in each of the cities uh, which part of the funding you would consider public which uh, private etc cetera, etc cetera. is it I, I mean if it's not too uh, Confidential, of course. Uh, if any of you can uh, say a few words about it, would be great. Just a minute, I have to check. <laughs> okay. Maybe Asian, if you can say uh, in to that. Yeah, I don't have the numbers here either. But the uh, commission's uh, idea was to to move us most private financing as possible. That's why I think <laughs> the biggest challenge is to, to involve citizenship and, and, and private sector because it's entailed to, to the financing part. As well. Absolutely. And to be realistic, if we want to achieve these, uh, this climate neutrality, you cannot do it only with public buildings, public transport. No, you have to involve everybody. And involving citizens, I think it was mentioned already, it's not easy unless you incentivize yes i think it was adrian who, who uh, rightly said it and i think it's fair to do it um, especially in the light of all these uh, latest uh, evolution in in europe but um, i think in general it is very promising and very paying back for uh, for our societies so i would see a great interest in uh, in the development of a potential green uh, bond for this but of course, we are not deciding that. Um, so maybe some uh, figures. I don't know if uh, you had some time to, to retrieve them. Maybe we can start with uh, Kozani. 
uh, if I remember well, the private uh, funding was roughly what uh, 40 percent was it 45 meters? 45 percent private okay. uh, 15 percent it's our own funding and this was our uh, if you remember uh, Yanis <laughs> our problem <laughs> yeah. this uh, percentage and the rest is public funding I think funding mostly coming from the European uh, programs, I guess. Yes, yes, sorry. I mean uh, from European, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, correct. And Luis, uh, Diane, you know uh, from how the funding is structured to sort of for the future, at least roughly? It was anyway very rough estimation. I mean, it was not yeah. even an estimation in the proposal. It was just shoot a number, <laughs> shoot a percentage. That's it. No explanation. Okay, of course, so. this, this we will have to do it um, in the in the next phase if we are uh, uh, approved there. Um, yeah. However, it's just interesting to know what's the you know the distribution. I can give some numbers in Pamplona as well. Hello? Yes, yes. Can you... Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, what we submitted is 67% uh, of private financing, which is huge. Yeah. And then uh, just 8-9% uh, uh, of own funds and 25% uh, of regional, national and EU funding. So, yeah, private funding is, uh, is key here at least in Pamplona's case. Of course, we can trust in more regional, national EU funding, but uh, that usually comes attached to, to specific programs and not easy to align always with, with what you really want or your local people want, so. 67% is, yeah, it's, it's very high. So I guess you will have to put in place a lot of different actions to engage with the private uh, sector and actually motivate yeah. them to invest. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, should be a huge challenge, I guess. I don't know if Anna, you found some numbers. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I found the numbers. I think it's the same, <laughs> same application okay. <laughs> that, that the others have, and and I was really really surprised when I heard that the others have um, private funding is quite high because for us uh, mm -hmm. they have put zero here for private funding, so, and then um, own funds forty five percent and regional national EU funds and financing 55. So I guess we are, um, well, we are <laughs> quite optimistic that we will get several EU projects for this, I guess. Um, I see the Finnish model is totally different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I also saw the number for, for the estimate. So that's um, 292 um, million. Yeah. And do you, do you also consider in Tampere that funding is one of the main challenges or usually? Um, I'm not sure if I, I, I think my, from my experience, it's uh, the people and not the money, <laughs> but, but I'm not sure if I'm, I'm mistaking. It's always the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The estimation the commission gave to, to carbon neutrality from average European cities, I think it was a uh, thousand million euros per uh, 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, uh, 10,000 per inhabitant, I think it was. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, Which uh, amount, amount of money, I mean, uh, uh, low, as Janis said, I think uh, just with public funds, uh, it's quite difficult to meet that. Of course, there are countries that can allow themselves to spend more public money, of course, but uh, situations are different. Yeah, and I guess that the starting point uh, between the cities uh, is very different. I mean, if you have already done a lot, then you don't need that much. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, re I really look at the number uh, Anna mentioned, 292. It's uh, less than half of what Kozani mentioned. But then again, Obviously, our needs are probably different, so that's why it's uh, that uh, that different. 
Uh, I don't know about Cluj. Uh, Adrian, did you manage to get some? No, I, I just talk with my colleagues to see the exact facts. On the other hand, I was thinking that uh, when you think of Greece, you don't really think of that uh, carbon dependent uh, cities and uh, regions, you know? You mainly see the blue skies and the blue sea and the solar and wind and things like that. So uh, yes. I think it's yes. quite a challenge for you to go decarbonizing and uh, going all on renewables. But on the other hand, I think you have uh, you're one of the most privileged in in terms of uh, the assets and the, the wind and the sun and the, the things that you can harvest, yep. the energy that you can harvest from this kind of uh, energy sources. Yeah. So unfortunately, exactly. I don't have the numbers, but um, I'm uh, gonna get back with the numbers. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm a bit surprised to see the the v, the very big differences among mm -hmm. our cities on the on the distribution and even on the per capita but as i said probably there is some explanation behind everything and mm -hmm. uh, what you said adrian is very correct uh, yes we're very privileged and it's so surprising <laughs> that we did not develop yet that uh, the whole the whole sector the whole industry i would say that solar thermal is the only industry developed for decades in greece and quite well developed mm -hmm. but not pvs not uh, wind uh, Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about only installing, but or developing because the Because the other itself. energy sources were cheap and people were not uh, thinking of... Uh... Yes, exactly, exactly. This is the case. This is the case of Lignite, uh, which is uh, very regional. Uh, so to, to give you an example, uh, Lignite provided more, uh, approximately three quarters of the electricity for the whole country coming from our region. So that gives the, the size, I mean. So if you have it that cheap, why bothering? Of course, now it's very much changing and the decarbonization is so much affecting our region that we uh, are you know, developing all these, um, all these transition models. And within this, renewable, uh, renewables are generally a very uh, strong aspect. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I also come from a very lignite dependent region from the north of Czechia, and I know it's, it doesn't take uh, a few years to change it because also it represents a lot of jobs and a lot of people are dependent on the sector, you know, so I think it takes time to actually shift from the fossil fuels to more renewable sources because you don't only have to change the energy systems, but also uh, you need to adapt the economy and make sure those people working in the sector can still find another possibilities to work so I think yeah, it's always uh, it's, it's always difficult to make such a change but not impossible I can see there's a question in the um, in the question box from uh, from one of the attendees maybe it's more direct to Koldo because it um, concerns the net zero cities so the question is are any of you part of the net zero cities strategic or practitioners panel and do you have any information on how cities can reach the panel and provide their insights interests or questions uh, I'm not part of that panel, but uh, I did. There, there was a, a call to, for cities to, to 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 submit their application to be on the panel. I think it was in it ended in the in, in early at early February. I'm I'm not I don't remember exactly, but I for sure it's it's already closed a month or a month and a half ago. So in that sense, I'm not sure if it will be possible to to join, uh, or if there will be at some point another call for 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 city panels. But I, I, I'm I'm afraid that they they have enough cities to provide feedback. And in case they don't, uh, then there will probably launch another call for that. Okay, thanks a lot. Anna had to leave us because she had another meeting. Um, I want to thank her for being with us today, but she left already. Well, she will be able to see it if she watches the recording. Maybe we can just um, now talk about the current context. How do you think what's happening in our geopolitically is influencing the objectives and in your respective cities? And do you think there's being a shift or a change in the perception of some of the things, for example, on gas or similar? How do you perceive it, for example, in Kozani, uh, uh, Yanis, do you think uh, current situation is having also impacts on the objectives you're having or 
on the way you were planning to proceed in, in the next 10 years? How can I put it uh, nicely? <laughs> it's, it's a very bad situation. It's a tragic, um, uh, it's a real tragedy. However, this situation, I think, has uh, really boosted the discussion on um, shifting from uh, fossil to, to greener future. Um, at least in our case, but I see all over Europe, the discussion is now uh, changing. So um, I would see that unless something else more dramatic happens, um, the situation will go definitely uh, greener. Um, not directly, of course, there will be other sources of uh, gas. So I think uh, Europe is, uh, is going fast to uh, change provider than change fuel itself, but uh, that is the very direct uh, result in the medium uh, term, uh, term, I would say that um, th there will be a major shift. And um, uh, maybe to mention here, it's not by accident that hydrogen is more and more mentioned, something that a few years ago was more like an elite discussion. Now it's, uh, it's uh, gaining really real importance in the agenda. And I think that, um, well, in our case, it's very convenient because it is in the national discussion. And probably if the national discussion uh, goes ahead as planned, it will be a major shift for our region as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as I said, it's a tragic uh, thing to, uh, to know that it's happening in our neighborhood, but once it is there, I think it really shifted uh, uh, the interest from uh, leaving uh, gradually uh, from fossil fuel to leaving fast from uh, fossil fuel. I don't know about the others. Thank you, Cordor. I would like to uh, add something. Well, actually, yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, big of a problem for us also in in this part of Europe, but uh, I think yes, it's going to be a different story after this conflict. And uh, as Danny said, at first we're gonna make sure that we have other sources of uh, I mean not other but other providers of energy for what we have now. But slightly we're gonna get to to um, to a different uh, sources of energy. And we feel it because we're in the most eastern part of the country of the Europe. So, it's not. Yeah, I think that Romania and Greece are affected quite a lot, but it doesn't really motivate people to become less dependent. Uh, I think Calder has disappeared. Maybe he, no, he's still there. And what about, for example, the pandemics? Uh, has it influenced somehow? Uh, the objectives or the plans or the implementation of these like uh, in a bad or in a good way for example in Kozanian is what do you think uh, it has been two years of pandemic so it, has, it, it must have had also some impacts I guess on the way you perceive things now yeah I mean there is no one question to give <laughs> um, of course it uh, really stopped every public meeting so if you want to get people on board and if you want to discuss things openly this is not the case anymore. So yes, we adapted, uh, we had to adapt. Uh, so online meetings are happening. Even our local meetings, as Dimitris knows, happened mostly online. Um, however, on the other hand, probably a coincidence, but because a national program for uh, building renovation was going on, uh, it really accelerated a lot the work. So, I mean, wherever you walk in, in the city, you see houses being renovated and, uh, you know, upgrading their energy efficiency. And that's a good part in the bad story. Um, well, I'm always a positive guy. I'm trying to find the, you know, the, the, the positive thing out even of the bad things. However, I, I saw that there was some space to deliver all these works, and that uh, was probably facilitated by the fact that not so many people were going around. Um, on the other hand, on the planning thing, I, I don't think it's, um, it affected a lot. Of course, with the, with the 
with a halt during the first days, weeks. But then after that, life came back to, to normal in the municipality, in the region, in the, uh, you know, in the services, uh, people, you know, managed to, to work uh, this or the other way. What about Pamplona? Color, do you think uh, that's going to change in the way people behave in the energy, in the energy way? Um, are they more sustainable nowadays? Or do you think there are more, for example, individual cars? Uh, do you perceive the impacts more positively or negatively in Pamplona or in Spain? Yeah, I think maybe it might be a similar case to, to Greece. I'm not sure. The, 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 the pandemic uh, released a weird situation where, for example, everybody wanted to go in isolated um, transport modes. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we reduced a lot uh, the need of transport. So that was positive. Uh, and I don't know, I think it's a very vo volatile situation after pandemic, uh, now with the war crisis and the limited uh, transport resources we are having uh, now hosted, um, how you call it, uh, the, the, the trade is stopping now in Spain in some, in some supermarkets and some supply chains uh, and that if it's going to, it's everything because of energy. So to me, the green transition is very much on, on, the, on individuals and how they reconvert to a green thinking, let's say, uh, how do they modify their, their usual patterns of life, of living. And that doesn't happen that much if you really don't have to. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think, uh, uh, the rising prices of energy, uh, the rising prices of petroleum and electricity, mainly, and gas, uh, it's affecting all of us transversely, no matter what we do. Uh, of course, if you are a, a truck driver, you are, uh, you are fucked up with bad words. <laughs> but, uh, if you have to hit your house, you are equally in a bad situation. And I think this can really bring a new paradigm uh, and accelerate this transition. But of course, it's very volatile because it's, this is just happening now, and we'll see in, in a couple of years where it where it goes. Indeed, I think there can be some opportunities in what's happening, and it might finally make people change some of the habits. I think we are quite over time, so uh, we should go to the finish. But I think it's been a nice discussion. We could discuss for hours, and I hope that uh, we'll keep collaborating between the cities because I think it's important <coughs> learning from each other. Because as we see, every city is different, has a different context, but maybe there's something else to offer. And learning from each other, I think, is the way to go, and especially in Europe. Uh, so uh, I will give the floor to Janis. Maybe he'll have a few uh, words to close the meeting. And I thank everybody from, from my behalf and from my behalf of Renovate for participating today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. No, I wouldn't add that much. Just to say that um, uh, despite our differences in numbers, etc., that I spotted before, I think we're um, uh, on a nice uh, boat on one hand, our stardust uh, ship, uh, ship actually, startup. Um, and on the other hand, we all applied for the same uh, mission. And I think we need to build upon this uh, common uh, ground and uh, maybe why not add in um, an extra session uh, within the next uh, Stardust uh, meetings uh, devoted to uh, mission and its consequences, um, especially if we are all uh, approved by the, by the commission, uh, which we all hope. Um, then, of course, we will need to uh, discuss further. I, I think there is a, a rich ground uh, of common topics or topics of common interest, like technologies, uh, financing, uh, governance, um, citizen engagement, stakeholder involvement, private sector involved. I mean, a whole lot of topics we couldn't touch, of course, uh, in two hours. However, I think there is um, a lot of interest here and we should uh, try to you know, build upon this. So with these words yes, from me, it's a uh, bye bye to everybody. But bye maybe bye. You want yeah, to uh, okay. close? A few words.
Thank you very much, everybody. It's been really, really interesting. I completely agree with you, Janice. Um, hopefully, all of you are chosen. And uh, this has to be added, and it will be enriched for startups, for the cities, and for all, all the cities, because as Koldo was saying, it's uh, not only for the 100 cities, but for all the European cities um, by 2050. The period is not so long, so action is needed uh, immediately. So very important what you just mentioned to add in the next sessions of Stardust and in all the possible events we think of. And we think that all of the cities are, all of our Stardust cities are chosen, the ones presented the expression of interest. And thank you very much. Short, but very interesting and very intense. Thanks a lot. And thank you, Martin. Good thank luck you, to everybody. all the cities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you all very soon. Thank you very bye. much. See you very soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Thanks a lot again. Bye bye. Bye.